Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you expecting God to do for you in terms of your spiritual walk with him? Or is it going to be a morning devotion, a time of prayer, coming to church, and all that? If I ask you the question, how many souls would you want to win for Christ by the end of the year? Do you have any idea? These are sort of questions I want us to begin to think about. Our time with God. A time in the Word of God. Just spending time with Him. How long would I want to spend with God each day? If you were to log how many hours you spend in prayer per day, how long would that be? Say, Pastor, I'm struggling to even spend five minutes with God. See, when you love someone, you want to spend more and more time with them. I've often spoken about when people fall in love in this church, and when I'm preparing them for, for marriage ceremonies, they tell me how long they spend in this day of mobile phones, how long they spend. And sometimes I wonder how, how they manage to get that time. But when you're in love with someone, you always find a time. Amen? And so I want to challenge you, because as I said, we are, we are focusing on fires of revival. So when you have your fire and I have my fire, we come together and there is an what? Explosion. Amen? But when you are cold and someone else is cold, you come and there's no action. Last week, we touched on the fact that a number of churches, even in our nation, will be called dead. But we want God to revive us. Amen? Amen? Amen. We want God to revive us as individuals. We want God to revive us as a church. We want God to revive us as a nation. I've been focusing on stories of revival. That is something that is so accessible these days online. You know, many, many revivals have come and gone, but I believe there's more to come. Some of the revivals were so radical and remarkable that the police didn't have people to arrest. <laughs> Amen? In other words, if the police wouldn't arrest anyone in, in Wales and in Ireland or all those places that had revivals, then the courts will not have anyone to judge then there will be peace in our community. We will look at the results of revival, true revival. You say, is that possible? Well, it happened in the past, and I believe that when you and I set ourselves apart to please God, he can do it again. Amen? Amen? Amen. In fact, I've got a book in my office that I was reading in the early hours of this morning. I think the, 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 the author is uh, um, Petty. Um, that's his surname. I met him in the Elim Church in Macclesfield, when I was a Bible college student, I did one of my placements in a church. He wasn't part of the church, but I think he lived in a Cheshire area, so he would visit that church every now and then. He's one of the presenters on Revelation TV, and he's put together a good amount of revival stories, and the title of the book is Do It Again, Lord. You can find it on Amazon. Amen? Do it again. I want, I want us to have that I want us to have that hunger. I want us to have that thirst. You know, that's what happened among the guys that were in the upper room when Jesus said to them, don't even start doing the work until you are endued with power. Often we try to do that in our own strength and we fail. And so we hear the psalmist, won't you revive us again, Lord? Hallelujah. We define revival as a fresh inflow of life, love, and power of God. Amen? Amen. You and I get power, the power of God when we spend time with him in prayer and in his word. Someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Every now and then, if we are honest with ourselves, we get, we get so exhausted and God knows that you and I cannot do without his power, and that's why he often reminds us to get revived. 
It comes a time when you are hungry, when you are thirsty, when there is this holy discontent in you that you want more, and God is there if only we will go to him. Hallelujah. Maybe you are lacking enthusiasm. You are lacking in faith, and you feel, I just want more of God. And so last week we looked at what are the steps that lead to such revival? What are the steps? We looked at three of them last week. If we are going to have such revival, number one, we must confess our need for revival. Hallelujah. If you are not well and you do not admit that you are not well, you are not going to get help. (laughs) Statistics and studies have shown that men are less likely to consult their doctors more than women. (laughs) I don't know why. But my doctor wouldn't say that about me. The little headache that I get, I'm in there. <laughs> the reason being that I pay my tax. And so I make, I make sure that I get uh, uh, attention from him. He's a good man. He's a good doctor. We get on very well. And so if you are hungry and you do not admit that you are hungry, you will not go looking for food. If you are desperate for something and that doesn't motivate you to get it, then you're not going to get that help. So if you and I are going to get revival, then we must admit, first and foremost, our need for revival. And for me, I believe that we need revival as a church. We need revival as a nation. We need revival as a community. As we looked at last week, the psalmist could say, as the deer pants for water brooks, so my soul. Hallelujah. So my soul pants for you. Not only do we need revival in the outside world around us, when we look around about this time we are beginning to get into the cold season, you will see homeless people. You will see all sorts of things going on. Our ruling party has just finished their annual conference, and there are all sorts of things going on. And we, you and I, need revival because of that. Where we believe there could have been unity for them to lead themselves, it's a newly appointed government, and yet there are already signs of division. We're going to look at the results of revival. When when there's revival, there is harmony. However, the enemy also hates revival, and therefore he will always find instruments that will bring discord to revival. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. Always. Just as we saw in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Always. And I pray that you will not be the instrument that the enemy will find to use when there is revival. Because that can be very, very dangerous. And so when we look at the world around us, we need revival. When we look at the church, last week I touched on the fact that denominations are dying. I used the Salvation Army as an example. Yesterday someone was telling me a story. In fact, I also told to a person who's a very committed member in the Methodist Church. There was a time that I went to conference in the Westminster Central Hall. And I'm, I'm speaking about this because they themselves have admitted their need for revival. And Westminster Central Hall will be like the Cathedral of Methodism. And as Willow Creek Association, uh, uh, which we are part of, and I'll go to their conferences, as we were having this leadership conference in the main auditorium, there, watch this, there in this place where John Wesley would have been so proud of, underneath where we were having this magnificent well-attended leadership church leaders conference, underneath the hall was a banner guiding people that I'm going to mention. They said that underneath the main hall was a LGBT leadership conference going on. In fact, watch this. You know what I did? I stood by that banner. I said, if I, if I share this with people, they might not even believe me. I stood by that banner to take a photograph. And this is what I said to my friends that were with me. I said, John Wesley will be turning in his grave. I'm saying this to prove to you that you and I need revival. You and I need to pray for revival to hit our nation. A man who was a catalyst of revival. John Wesley will be regarded as one of the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic leaders in his time. 
And in the main, in the building, whilst we were here worshiping, they were also having their meeting down there. And if that doesn't tell us that we need a revival, then I don't know what we need to hear in order for us to pray for revival. There's compromise in our society. So much compromise that it has seeped into the church as well. And people will say, oh, pastor, it doesn't matter. They are also human beings. Who said that they are not also human beings? But as human beings, we must proclaim the word of God undiluted, without compromise, pleasing people. In fact, when they agreed, when the Methodism in the United Kingdom agreed that um, they will officiate what they consider union between a man and a man, a union, because I, I, I hesitate to call it marriage. <laughs> well, they call it civil partnership anyway. The Ghanaian Methodism came out to say that they are not part of it. But someone said to me yesterday, they said, well, that hasn't really come to fruition. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? They said that when they are here, when the, when the, when the Methodist ministers are posted to the United Kingdom, two-thirds of their pay come from UK Methodism. <laughs> and so at the moment, because of the money, they haven't completely ruled out because if they say they will not be part of UK Methodism, they're going to lose the two-thirds. I'm thinking, you will have your money because I want to go to heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God can provide, amen? amen? If we fulfill our part. So I'm talking about the reason why you and I need Revival, uh, if we are going to have revival, that we have to have a need, a desperate, we need to confess our need for revival because there's a need around us, a need in the church, and a need in our own lives. We should never come to a point when we will say that, I, 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 I have prayed enough. When you and I come to a place where we think we've arrived when it comes to prayer, last week we looked at a man called, a man that we called, uh, they called the one-eyed black man, William Seymour, to do with the Azusa Street Revival. We, William Seymour was, was praying five hours a day, and God still asked him to pray some more. Wow! Hmm. So in our personal lives, we cannot say, oh, I've read through the Bible enough. And I cannot, I don't want to read. You and any time we go to the Bible, God will say something to us. Hallelujah. There may not be any revival until we are willing to admit our desperate need for revival. Last week we looked at the number two. We must admit the possibility of revival. We must admit that. that when we trust God, he will bring revival. Someone say amen. amen. If you are convinced that he will answer our prayer, just as the psalmist said in Psalm 85, verse 6. We say, won't you revive us again? Then we must be desperate. That's what will lead some of the countries we come from. That's what will take them to morning devotions, where whole churches will gather. Even some of the Presbyterian, the Methodism, and the Anglican, the Catholic Church will go so early. It's very, very common in South Korea. I'm going to touch on the the Korean revival in a moment. So if we're going to have revival, we confess our need for revival, we admit the possibility of revival. Last week we touched on the final one that we must recognize the source of the revival, that it doesn't come from man, but it comes only from who? God and God alone. And when it happens, he alone must gain all the glory due to his precious name. Today I'm going to give you four more points before we go. Number four, if we're going to have revival, we must employ the means for securing revival. What is the secret of revival? I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you one big one. It's prayer. You see what happened in um, Nineveh? The king admitted that they are in trouble. And he said even animals must be covered with sackcloth. That is desperation. When was the last time you got your pet dog or your pet cat to fast? We put them on diet. <laughs> when we go and we get their food <laughs> in the supermarket, if they are putting on weight, we put them on diet. In Nineveh, when Jonah, where well, Jonah didn't want to go, the king responded to the disappointment of the prophet. 
The prophet said, I, well, I knew that you were going to forgive them. Why wouldn't God forgive them? <laughs> and I'm going to touch on prejudices that can stop revival. God hates prejudice. This person isn't like me. They don't talk like me. They don't wear the things I want to wear. And so God hates that. Hallelujah. What is the secret of revival? It is prayer. Will you not revive us again? Passionate, believing, urgent prayer will bring revival. Has there ever been a revival that was not preceded by prayer? I haven't come across that in my research. In the upper room, they were waiting upon the Lord, just as Jesus has instructed them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He had instructed them. And in Acts chapter 2, while they are waiting, the Spirit of God came. Someone say, Amen. Amen. The Moravian revival, the 1859 revival, the Welsh revival, movements of the Spirit that are taking place in different parts of the world today have come as a result of prayer. And we looked at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He says, if my people, my people, even as believers, we need revival. Someone say amen. amen. So over here he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I thought prayer was to seek face. That is getting deeper. Not only pray, but seek the face of God. Say, Lord God Almighty, wouldn't you hear me? Wouldn't you come through for me? That poultry farmer, big poultry farmer, that um, most Ghanaians would have heard his name, Mr. Darko. Not the one that we are praying for on the prayer line. But a poultry farmer, a tithe payer. There was a time before I left Ghana, he will, he will, he will supply suits, decent suit for, as the Assemblies of God Bible College student, and all of them. This time he's gone well over that. And he got into his farm. I'm talking about desperate prayer. He got onto one of his farms, and, and, and the chicken were dying left, right, and center. And the desperation of this man was such that he picked up one of the chickens and said, Lord God Almighty, you're going to have to hear me because I pay my tithe. That's desperation. You know what happened? They stopped dying. At times, God, God wants you and I to come to him with an attitude of desperation. In the history, um, the black history stuff, one slave woman had a, her son at the market for slaves, and the bell was going. That boy was being auctioned. This is this is a kind of an alien concept to you and I this day and age. We've never seen a human being being sold, maybe. And this woman, this slave woman, stood by the fence, and she was praying, Lord, God Almighty, please give me back my son. And she was crying out, and she was crying out. It got to a point and said, Lord, God Almighty, if I were you, I will save this child and give him back to his mom. And, and, and a rich man heard the woman's prayer. He bought that son and gave him back to her mom, his mom. That's an answer to prayer. What if she had gone, oh, Lord God Almighty, our Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. If she had prayed some civilized prayer, I don't think the results would have been the same. She said, if I were you, oh God, and a, 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 and a woman's child is being sold at this auction, I will buy that son and give him back. And that's exactly what that rich person did. That's the prayer of desperation. So we're going to have revival. If we're going to have revival, then we must humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways. Then I will hear. Can you give me the verse before Mass? Uh, verse 13, before we come to uh, verse 14, if you give me Second Cro uh, Chronicles chapter uh, 7, verse 13, if you can. Hallelujah. I'll show you. I just want, you, I want us to compare what was there before. He said, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, 
if. In other words, when there's such desperation, hallelujah, we often go straight to verse 14 without checking what is in verse 13. When there's this hopelessness, and you come to me, and if you call me by name, humble yourselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So revival, we must employ the means of securing revival. We must get rid of sin. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. We must get rid of division. We must get rid of bitterness. We must get rid of anything that displeases God. If we are desperate for revival. So that is number four. Number five, if we're going to have revival, we must provide the channels for revival. We must provide the channels for revival. God is wanting to send revival. But he needs channels, and the channels he needs is us. He said, won't you revive us again? Won't you restore us? Referring to Christians or believers. Revival is the outflow of the Spirit of God through the regenerated Spirit of man. I want to say that again. Revival is the outflow of the spirit, uh, outflow of the spirit of God through the regenerated, not the old man, the regenerated spirit of man. Hallelujah. Thus, if revival is to come, you and I are to be ready to receive the full blessing of God and to be channels through whom that blessing can flow. John chapter seven verse thirty-seven. On the last day, on the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone, someone say anyone. anyone. So you and I are candidates to be channels of revival. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This is Jesus' own words. Whoever, that's verse 37, verse 38 says, whoever believes in me as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Rivers of living water. You are a candidate. You are, are a channel through which God can bring revival. Verse 39 says, By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So if we're going to have revival, we must provide the channels for revival. You cannot say, here is a, a woman that you can use. Here is a, a gentleman you can use. You and I need to make ourselves available as channels of revival. Someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Number six. We must remove the obstacles of revival. Uh, sorry, yeah. We, we must remove the obstacles to revival. I've touched on that. I want to repeat. In verse 6 of Psalm 85, the psalmist prays for revival that your people may rejoice in you. This indicates fellowship, coming together. The Bible says that do not forsake the assembly together with the brethren. Fellowship. Walking with God, agreement with God. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, Can two walk together unless they agreed? Can two walk together? And so, if you and I are going to have revival, we must be, be in the fellowship, walking with God, agreeing with God, being right with God. The greatest barrier to revival is sin. Are you right with God? We must, we, we must ask ourselves this question. Am I right with God? Is there sin in my life? Are you living in disobedience to the Lord? We've got to face up to it. Many years ago, some of you might have heard of a man called D.L. Moody, a great evangelist that preceded Billy Graham. He heard um, uh, um, Henry v Valley says, the world has yet to see what God will do with one man who is fully surrendered to him. Dear Moody said, by God's grace, I will be that man. 
by God's grace, I will be that man. Hallelujah. Would you be able to say that? That you go back to your house, you shut yourself in your room and say, by God's grace, I want to be that man, I want to be that young lady, I want to be that woman that will be totally surrendered to God. A bit of a challenge there for all of us. By God's grace, not by your own strength. Will you be that person? Will you be another dear Moody? Will you begin now to pray the same prayer for your church that the world may see what God can do? We're talking about the obstacles to revival. Uh, during the Korean revival, and sometimes because revival has been going on in South Korea for so long, in Seoul, sometimes when we talk about the Korean revival, we think it, it started in Seoul. No, it didn't. It started in Pyongyang, North Korea. Now, there was a man who was a catalyst to the revival in Korea. And when we talk about revival in Korea, it, both, it covered both South because it was later on that Korea was divided. So this man was called Dr. Hardy. Some people might spell it with a Y. Some people might spell it with an IE. So Dr. Hardy was asked by the Methodism from America, were sending missionaries, other denominations were sending missionaries. So the missionaries were not having real success. And there was a time, I think during Pastor Derek's time here, a missionary, an early missionary came from Ghana. And he said he had been in Spain for how many years? Six years or so. He said he's only got six souls. That is hard. When you preach the word, when you fast, when you distribute trust, when you do all that you are doing and the message is not going, it can be so frustrating. I remember that missionary very well. It was the evening service. In those days, we used to have evening service. And he stood here and he said, it is so hard. And similar thing was happening in the Korean revival. So they asked Mr. Hardy, who was a medical doctor, to write devotions. And the missionaries will meet, and they will encourage each other. They will pray together, and they will meet with the people and all that. But Mr. Hardy, whilst he was preparing the devotionals, felt so convicted that God was saying to him, the Spirit of God was saying to him, you got to repent. Before these devotions will be so active and effective, you got to repent. And you will ask, what was Mr. Hardy's sin? And later on, Hardy himself broke down in the midst of the congregation, very small congregation, because they were not being successful at all. And folks, we will not get very far when we have not done things right to please God. Amen? So Hardy broke down in front of people. And you don't do that in Korea. They are very private. They are very... Uh, in other words, they don't show their emotions openly. But he broke down and he confessed before them of his prejudice. And this was the prejudice that he had. He felt that he had gone there from the Western world and his status as a missionary, he was superior to the people that he was serving. And that is not the Jesus I know. He left his throne above, he came down, he took on our flesh to be like us in order to win us. And so the Spirit of God convicted him, and when Mr. Hardy broke down to ask the forgiveness of the people, the people also started confessing their sins to him that his attitude wasn't favorable to them. And when the people cried, and Mr. Hardy cried, and everybody cried, revival started coming to Korea. Yeah. Hallelujah. Obstacles to revival. If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and, 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 and turn from their wicked ways and, and all that, then God said, then I will hear them from heaven. And I mentioned throughout this third series, three, three weeks, this one being, it's a very dangerous sin. Uh, uh, no revival will go by without someone availing themselves for the enemy to use. And I say, it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Very, very dangerous thing. Often God will just take them out. If the people don't take them out, God himself will take them out. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Are you willing? Are you ready? Are you determined to make yourself available? There are a, a number of us, there are certain cupboards in our rooms and in our house that you don't want anyone to go there. 
Perhaps it's an area of sin, maybe sexual sin, financial sin. In the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they lied. He said, Pastor, oh, there are white lies and black lies. I, can, I don't see that in my Bible. <laughs> Amen? I don't see that in my Bible. And, me, and we might not see, but God sees. Hallelujah. I must admit that at times I'm blown away by the transparency of God's people, even in this church. In a sense, they say, Pastor, this is what I'm doing. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm thinking, wow. It's not because of I've come after you. People out of their own will. They say, I don't want to do that. I want to do, I want to do things right. Hallelujah. And God who sees the sincerity of our heart will be the one who will bless us. Amen? Amen. J. John preached on the Ten Commandments in Clapham Park. And when he got to the place where he was focusing on that shall not steal, come and see the things that people have stolen from their workplaces, from their friends, all sorts of things. They put barrels there. And that evening, I think Mama Rosaduku mentioned that she was there at that point. People were bringing all sorts of things. Amen? Amen. That's what brings revival. That's what brings revival. When we say, I cannot hold on to this habit anymore. I cannot continue to do this anymore. I come to church. I read my Bible. I'm in ministry. I'm even standing on a platform and I'm behaving this way. I cannot do it. And God said, yeah, now. I'm, revo- I'm removing. By my conviction, I'm removing things. And if you continue to do that, then I'll come and visit you. True revival. True revival. Hallelujah. Oh, precious Lord, do it again. Do it again, oh God. We shall enjoy the results of revival. If you continue to read the whole chapter, you see that in times of revival, he said, read, I haven't got time to read the whole chapter again. But if you continue to read Psalm 85, you notice several results. Salvation is mentioned. A man called Duncan Campbell experienced revival in the Hebrides. Oh, precious Lord. Not many salvation Messages were preached. But this is the description. They said, when people were going to church, the streets were black. I don't know. I think it was the hair of the people. Just flocking to church. Flocking to the places of meetings. The streets were flooded. People just cannot wait to get to the place of prayer. The place where, they... last week, um, we learned that William Seymour, at times, he didn't know what to say. He would just bury his head. And the, and, the conv- and the leadership of the Holy Spirit will just lead the meetings. Alexander Body in Sunderland will also just sit and allow the Spirit of God to hover upon the people. The Hebrides Revival came as a result of two sisters, one called Peggy, one called Christine. They were kind of disabled. They were not healthy people. They went to their pastor because they, they had a dream of young people flocking to the church. And, and the pastor said to them, what must we do? And the two sisters said, we're going to have to pray. And they prayed. Sometimes they would start from 10 p.m. in the evening and they will pray till 3 a.m. You know, we used to have half night of prayer and we thought we were spiritual. These sisters. And then the sisters challenged the church leadership the pastor and his elders, that if we are praying, then you are going to have to pray. And twice a week or so, the pastor and his elders will meet in a barn, animal barn, and they will pray, and they will pray. We're talking about the Hebrides revival. And now, as they kept praying for weeks, on one occasion, one of the elders took um, Psalm 24. He felt led to Psalm 24. And then as he read Psalm 24, he asked the question, Oh Lord, are my hands clean? And is my heart right? The Spirit of God was convicting him there. Are my hands clean? And is my heart right? 
And he said, as they continued to pray, after this elder had been led to Psalm 24, they felt the Spirit of God physically just coming upon them. Just coming. They felt something was in there. And that was the catalyst. That was the beginning of the Hebrides revival. I just said earlier on, that if you and I are going to have a, re, a, a visitation, a tangible visitation of God among us, we must have, like the birthing of a child, we must get to a place of traveling. Traveling. Not all these wishy-washy kind of prayer. Praying for people to be happy. That's not the prayer that will move God. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, that you and I will come to a place where we will pray. And so there was salvation. And where there's revival, there can be harmony, peace. And we will sense the glory of God. And increase and provision. Provision in such a way that Barnabas, the son of encouragement, will sell his property and bring the proceeds to the feet of the apostles. I will never stop testifying about the provision of God. For what we are enjoying now. Amen. For what we are enjoying now. There's a place for that. There's a place for that. It doesn't glorify God when you and I are running after loans and this, I'm going to do the work of God and I'm, I'm burdened with loans and I'm, I'm burdened with issues. And I've said to God, if you are sending me somewhere, if you don't give me the provision, I'm not going to ask anybody for the provision. Amen. If you are sending me, a man of faith, though, me, man of faith, yet I want to see before I go. Amen. And God has. Amen. He has done in the past. He will do it again and again. Amen. Yes. In times of revival, and, and Duncan Campbell at the Hebrides, he says, it wasn't about the numbers. It was the atmosphere. And when people came, they didn't want to go home. Mike Morgan who was part of this church. He said, at some point, they will come to the minor hall in the old building, and they will just pray and pray that they, don't, they, they didn't want to go home. At some point, there was something that looked like house groups in the church, and she went, with one, and she went to one home, and she said, when she got there, there was prayer going on in this, in this home group. And she said, as she put her back, hand back down, knelt by this chair, she prayed and prayed, and the, the next thing they heard, the leader was clapping their hands and saying, brothers and sisters, it's now 3 a.m. Shall we go home? Hallelujah. When was the last time you overstayed at your cell group? <laughs> because she said she didn't know that they had been kind of raptured in the presence and the power of God, so much so that no one could even look at their watch. Amen. Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Amen? The steps of, the, of a good man. Some translations will say, The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. I pray that you and I will have our fire, and our fire will lead us to, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and that, and that God will order our steps and our thoughts as I often pray. The songwriter says, Revive thy work, O Lord, now to thy saints appear. O speak with power to every soul, and let thy people hear. Revive thy work, O Lord, while here to thee we bow. Descend, O gracious Lord, descend. O come and bless us now. Revive thy work, O Lord, and every soul inspire. O kindle in each heart, we pray, the Pentecost sapphire. Hallelujah. Revive thy work, O Lord, exalt thy precious name, and may thy love in every heart be kindled to a flame. I'm talking about fires of revival, folks. Revive thy work, O Lord, and bless to all thy word. Where there's revival, there's a, a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. And may its pure and sacred truth in living faith be heard. Revive thy work, O Lord, and make thy saints bold. 
convict of sin, and work once more as in the days of old. Finally, the sixth stanza says, Revive that work, O Lord. Give Pentecostal showers. Be thy glory, thine alone. The blessing, Lord, be ours. Amen? It's a very powerful one. The last two ones, it says, Be thy glory alone, thine alone. Be, be thy the glory, thine alone. The blessing, Lord, ours. One key thing, and I have, I have especially the modern day revivals. When God started doing these things, we see that the attention is put on man. And God said, my glory I will share with no man. It's good to write books. At times we don't study revivals, so they, when they hit us, we don't manage it well. The best way to manage revival is to make sure that while people are being saved, whether there's harmony and all that, you always constantly point everything to God. And he says that the glory is yours, but the blessing ours. Appropriating what is right. Amen? Amen. Oh, I pray that there will be such hunger, that there will be such desperation, that there will be such eagerness in your own life and in my life, so that when we come together, at all times, we will sit and say, Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. Would you stand up and pray that prayer? Lord, do it again. Heavenly Father, in my life, do it again. In my sister's life, do it again. In my brother's life, do it again. Heavenly Father, you are faithful. Oh, you are faithful. You heard every word that has gone out of this pulpit this morning. Do it again, O oh Lord. You've done it before in many, many places. You've done it in this church before. Father, we want your move. Let God cry out to God. Express, confess your need for revival. And expect God to revive you. If there are any obstacles to revival, remove them. Be a vessel, a clean vessel for God, as a catalyst for revival. Glory be to God. And let us focus that all the glory will go to his precious holy name. Father, thank you, Lord. We leave this place knowing that your word has gone forth and it shall not return to you void. It will surely accomplish that for which you've sent it. And so now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Give glory to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. May the Lord be with you and be with all of us. Amen? Thank you so much for coming. Amen.